Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In the previous video, we talked about the deep neck flexors. This was a group of four very small, very weak muscles on the anterior surface of the cervical vertebrae that act mainly to retract the cervical spine by producing flexion of the upper cervical spine. Now we're gonna shift gears and talk about the suboccipital muscles, which really just lie on the opposite side of the upper cervical spine, and they're gonna act mainly to extend that region of the spine, but very weakly. So these are gonna be the deep neck extensors. So the deep neck extensors are again four very small muscles on the posterior side of the cervical spine. Those are rectus capitis posterior major, rectus capitis posterior minor, obliquus capitis superior, and obliquus capitis inferior. Now the general functions of this group, which is the suboccipital group, but also called the deep neck extensors, are really two things. One, to produce cervical protraction by extending the upper cervical spine, and that can help facilitate movement of your head towards a target. So, for example, if you needed to move your head a little bit closer to something, maybe to read something that's a little bit up close and you can't quite make out the words, we've all done that, right? There's small print on a page or on your computer screen. You actually protract your head forward like this. Now, the deep neck flexors were responsible for retraction because they flex the upper cervical spine, but don't really have any action on the lower cervical spine. So remember, cervical spine is divided into two regions. The smaller part up top, here in this lighter color, this is the upper cervical spine. It really consists of the joint here between the occiput or occipital condyles and the atlas C1, which is the atlanto-occipital joint. And then this joint here between the atlas and the axis C2, the atlanoaxial joint. That's really all it is. And then all the other joints here between C2 and C3 down, these are all the lower cervical spine. Okay? When we talk about the deep neck extensors, they're going to facilitate extension, but only of that upper cervical spine. They don't have any action at the lower cervical spine. If you're talking about extension there, and really gross extension, you're thinking really of the splenius muscles, the upper traps, those larger muscles are going to produce the majority of extension. But when we look at cervical protraction and posturing in this position, there's going to be a little contraction of those deep neck extensors. Okay. Now, what did we say about chronic posturing in a protracted position like this? This is really common uh, in conditions like upper cross syndrome, which is really just a description of posture. Got these forward rounded shoulders, tight chest muscles, tight upper traps, more kyphosis in the T-spine right here. So kind of bent forward, this bad posture. You see it a lot in people who are always bent over a computer at work, even video gamers, you'll see this in what did we say about that? Remember that the deep neck flexors tend to be a little bit weak, okay? And then in contrast, these suboccipital muscles back here, deep neck extensors, these are gonna become tight, okay? One of the interesting things about posturing like this is you might think it's very passive, pretty easy to maintain a posture like that. But it turns out that while you're postured like that, the suboccipital muscles here actually are contracting, okay? They are postural endurance muscles. So when you're like that, they are contracting to a really small extent. And when they remain contracted like that, they get tight. It's just like if you are chronically in a hip flexed position. What happens to your hip flexors? You get a hip flexor contracture, right? If you're chronically in a plantar flexed position, your gastrocs go into a contracture. It's the same type of thing. They just get tight when you're always like this, okay? And when they get tight, they tend to also produce pain. That pain can stay in the neck area. It can also refer into the head, producing what's called a cervicogenic headache. We're going to talk about that a little more in the next video. So over here, anterior upper cervical spine, this is where we have those deep neck flexors. But on the posterior upper cervical spine, this is where we have the suboccipital group, which are the deep neck extensors.
Word to the wise, if you ask somebody to look up at the ceiling, basically go into cervical extension, okay, the vast, vast majority of that movement is provided by the upper traps, the splenius muscles, okay? There's very little, very, very little that's provided by the suboccipital muscles because they are postural muscles. They are not designed to exert a large amount of force, not gross movement. Really just fine-tuning this upper cervical extension and holding you in that posture, okay? That'll play a role really in the next video when we talk about how to treat tight suboccipital muscles, or in some cases, how to strengthen them, which is not really common that you'd ever have to do that. Let's now talk about the suboccipital muscles in more detail. And as we mentioned, there were four of these. In order to see the suboccipital muscles, you have to peel off pretty much everything because we're really right up to those vertebrae. But right here, you see in blue, the rectus capitis posterior major. It's going to originate off of the spinous process of C2, the axis right here, and it's going to come up and really insert on the occiput at the inferior nuchal line, right? So there's rectus capitis posterior major. All of these muscles right here are actually innervated by the suboccipital nerve, so this you'll see over and over again. The suboccipital nerve actually comes from the dorsal ramus of the C1 spinal nerve, okay? When we looked at the deep neck flexors, those were all ventral rami. These are going to be from the dorsal rami, specifically the suboccipital nerve. Now the action of this muscle is to produce atlanto-occipital extension. Again, overall extension, vast majority is like the upper traps, let's say. But there is a small amount um, that's going to be produced at this atlanto-occipital joint. Now you say, what about the atlanto-axial joint? Well, the atlanto-axial joint between C1 and C2 really just allows rotation. There's a little bit of other degrees of freedom, but it's mostly rotation. So the extension is mainly going to occur at the adeno-occipital joint, but then notice this muscle can give a little bit of ipsilateral rotation. So the rotation component is going to be mainly at the adeno-axial joint. Okay? And then the blood supply is via the vertebral artery and the occipital artery. Then we have in orange here the rectus capitis posterior minor. So this is the smallest of these muscles, and it originates here off of the posterior tubercle of C1, the atlas. The posterior tubercle of the atlas is the, an, an analog to a spinous process, but remember the atlas doesn't have spinous process. It only has a posterior tubercle. And then this muscle goes up and inserts on the inferior nuchal line of the occiput. So there's rectus capitis posterior minor. Again, innervations by the suboccipital nerve, but look at the action here. Rectus capitis posterior minor is actually extremely, extremely weak, okay? All four of these are weak, but this is the weakest muscle, kind of like the analog of the rectus capitis lateralis in the deep neck flexors. That being said, some sources will say, okay, it does a little bit of atlanto-occipital extension, but it's way too weak for that, way too small. What it actually probably does is serve a proprioceptive function, kind of indicating to the brain where the neck is in space. Because this muscle is found to have a lot of muscle spindles, so it's going to be really good um, at detecting stretch and relaying that proprioceptive information to the brain. Okay, So not a lot of actual action in terms of muscles, but more proprioceptive, more sensory in nature. Blood supplies also via the vertebral artery and the occipital artery. Now, in green here, we have the obliquus capitis superior, okay? These two in green and red here are termed obliquus because they run at angles, of course, okay? And this one's the superior one. It's going to originate off of the lateral mass here of the atlas, see the lateral mass of C1, and comes up here and inserts on the inferior nuchal line of the occiput, okay? As you might guess, suboccipital nerve is what innervates it. And it's going to produce a little bit of atlanto-occipital extension, again, not a lot, and some ipsilateral side bending. Just like uh, flexion and extension, side bending also tends to occur at the atlanto-occipital joint. Really, the only motion that's going to be atlanto-axial is rotation. This one doesn't really have a rotational role. It's more of a side bending role. Really, I should say stabilization in a side bended position. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Blood supply, also vertebral artery and occipital artery. The last one here in red is the only one that doesn't insert on the skull. This is obliquus capitis inferior. Okay, 
In a previous video, I said capitis implies that it inserts on the skull. Uh, this is a misnomer. Okay? Capitis does imply that a muscle inserts on the skull, but I heard someone say jokingly one time, scientists shouldn't name things, right? Uh, there's all sorts of discrepancies. So this is one of those discrepancies. Even though it has capitis in the name, it does not insert on the skull at any point. It originates off of the C2 spinous process right here, and then extends diagonally over to the C1 lateral mass. Okay? C2 spinous process to the C1 lateral mass. Some sources for obliquus capitis superior and inferior will, instead of saying lateral mass, they'll actually say transverse process. Okay? But the source I looked at said lateral mass. This muscle is innervated by the suboccipital nerve. Surprise, surprise and can produce a little bit of ipsilateral rotation. That would actually be at the atlantal axial joint where most rotation occurs, okay? Blood supply, vertebral artery, and the occipital artery. Now I want you to look at something here for a moment. If you look at the green muscle, which is obliquus capitis superior, this one in red, obliquus capitis inferior, and then the blue one, which was rectus capitis posterior major, you notice they actually kind of form a triangle. And people like to find landmarks, things that they recognize, right? So a triangle is a common thing. So we actually term this triangle the suboccipital triangle. That's what we're going to talk about right now. We're going to talk about its vertices, its boundaries, and then what it contains. These are things you typically need to know. So the vertices are the points here, okay? So what are the points? Well, we have the superior point, which is really somewhere on the inferior nuchal line right here. The lateral one over here is the C1 lateral mass. Sometimes it would be transverse process. And then the inferior one, which is most medial right here, would be the C2 spinous process, sometimes called the bifid process because the spinous process has two little things that poke out at the end. Okay? So those are the vertices of the suboccipital triangle. Most often what you'll actually need to know are the boundaries. And those are really just the three suboccipital muscles that make up the triangle. This one right here would be rectus capitis posterior major. Over here would be obliquus capitis superior. And then this one would be the obliquus capitis inferior. The one in orange over here, remember that was rectus capitis posterior minor. That one does not comprise the suboccipital triangle. Okay? Only these three muscles do. Okay? And then what does it contain? Well, it contains two things. One, the suboccipital nerve, which is the nerve that innervates all four of these muscles. And then it also contains the vertebral artery. Okay? Now the vertebral artery technically is coming up from C6. It's rising up here. And then it kind of curves around here. And as it goes into the uh, cranium, it becomes the vertebrobasilar artery. So what does it mean it contains the vertebral artery? Well, if you were to take your finger and really poke on the suboccipital triangle, you'd be right in the region where... The vertebral artery is. Meaning, if you took a needle, let's say, and poked it straight into the suboccipital triangle, you run the risk of actually puncturing the vertebral artery. Okay? That would play a role more in things like dry needling, but also when we start looking at palpation of the suboccipital triangle, knowing where that is, can actually give us a good point to actually palpate these three muscles up here. And we're not really going to differentiate them, but we want to get generally where these muscles are. So we want to know where the suboccipital triangle is so that we actually don't do anything there. Okay? It's a sensitive area. We don't want to poke it too hard or stick a needle in there because we could puncture these two things. And I would argue that the vertebral artery is much more important considering it goes up and supplies the brain stem, specifically the midbrain, via the basilar artery. So we don't want to mess with that triangle too much, but knowing where it is can help us find these muscles up here. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. In the next video, we're going to talk about applications of the suboccipital triangle and the suboccipital muscles um, and talk about things like a suboccipital release and a suboccipital stretch. So make sure to join us then. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.